in a recent study, we discussed uh, what it is to be assembled as the saints. And it, I realized that there are some words that are useful in the New Testament for us that we can look at and understand what it means to be assembled and perhaps what it does not mean to be assembled. But let's start with what it does mean. There is um, famously, um, there's famously a word, ekklesia, the Greek word ekklesia, from which you get things like ecclesiastical, etc. <clears throat> which is literally ek, meaning out, and kles is called um, or calling, so the people who are called out. But that's the literal meaning. What it really is getting at is an assembly duly summoned, <laughs> and something that was called for, uh, you know, something regular, orderly, uh, brought together in public, called out because they're called out from their homes into the public. <clears throat> I did think it was interesting that in the lexicon we have also, in addition to the normal meaning of the word, supplied one for how it was used in the Septuagint, that's LXX, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and also in the New Testament as the church, the body of Christians. It's interesting that they noted the Jewish congregation, the congregation of the people, the congregation in the wilderness, is translated by this word ecclesia, which we would also think of as the church. And that in the New Testament, the church is the body of Christians, and he cites Evangelion, or you you know, the Gospel of Matthew 16, 18, the first epistle to the Corinthians 11.22, the epistle to the Romans 16.5. Um, and then a reference as a building. And I think that is a codex of Justinian, perhaps? Uh, so this is now a different thing entirely, as in it's not until human religion is invented that people start thinking of ecclesia as a building. In the Old Testament, the Ecclesia is the congregation of the people. However many million of them left <coughs> Egypt, for example, are nonetheless a congregation in the wilderness. And in the New Testament, it is the body of the Christians, the church, the gathering of the people. So I thought it was interesting that they noted its use as a building doesn't come along until Catholicism, basically. <coughs> because it's not a building, it's an assembly. Now, there is an interesting thing about this word assembly that you can find in Acts 19, which I think is worth looking at. Uh, specifically, there was a riot, what we would call a riot. And I understand that it's always hard to define things in the eyes of the people. But in Acts 19, when uh, the silversmiths organized some kind of a riot, some kind of a takedown, political violence, basically, to uh, uh, intimidate our brethren and to repulse uh, Paul and the others. The thing that they brought about was people rushing together into the public square. Well, that is an assembly. They did call people to come, and people did gather, and it was in public. This is an ecclesia in Acts 19.32. The assembly was in confusion, though. The assembly is the ecclesia. That's the church, if you like to think of it that way, but that's what I'm trying to get across to you, is you shouldn't think of it that way. It really is just the gathering, the assembly, um, and the reason for that is if you can separate it out in your mind from being a technical term for a religious gathering of Christians, then you can start to understand some things about it that are useful lessons. One of those things here in Acts 19, you have this assembly or what is every other place that it occurs in the New Testament is translated church, but here they call it assembly. <laughs> <clears throat> What you find here, some cried one thing, some cried another thing. The assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. 
And when finally somebody gained sway with the assembly to disperse this crowd of people, he said, if you are looking to settle any legal matters with these people, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. Well, that is another, that is the same word for church. It's the same word for assembly. They're in public. They're called out of their homes for a reason. But he's saying, if you're going to do this, you need to do it in a lawful way. We have courts. We have a magistrate. We have a system for dealing with these things. This riot is not the system. Now, all of that aside, what's interesting to us from our you know, selfish uh, uh, pursuit of the meaning of assembly is it's defined by the reason for which people are called out. Why were they summoned here? That's, that's the thing. Why were they called out? What is the purpose for this? It's an assembly, and, and then somebody will say, well, it's a church. Well, church is not real. I mean, that, that's an English word, and it doesn't even mean what it's supposed to mean. It comes from Old High German Kirk, which is a high pointy place or a spire. So that one's talking about a building, which is the late Catholic definition of the word, not the original meaning. It is rather defined by the reason for which they came together. It's only a church of Christ if it is gathered for Christ and for his purposes. If the reason for which it came together is that it was duly summoned by God's word. This is what defines the church. It's only the church if it was summoned by God. It's only the church if its reason for coming together is godly. And yes, um, we will say, perhaps you've somewhat humorously, and perhaps not humorous, very sad, but the truth is there are a lot of churches that are in confusion, where one cries out one thing and one cries out another thing, and most of whom do not know why they had come together. That happens. The churches are made up of these kinds of messes sometimes, where people do not know what it's for, or why we are gathered, or to do what, or who is in charge, which is Jesus, by the way. Spoiler alert. Okay, but those are things that you learn from realizing that it's it's really a gathering, a call, you know, calling out, but calling out from your private places to a public place by means of a summons. You've been called together. This was called for, but who called for it? And why was it called for? What is its purpose? Those are the questions that need to be answered for the churches to be right with God. Now, the other word for assembly is synagogue. Synagogue, which is also a Greek word. And it's defined in this way in the lexicon, a bringing together, an assembly, drawing together, contracting of persons, a collection, a combination, a conclusion, or an inference, as in if you draw things together in your mind, then you're bringing it all into one place. That's a conclusion. <laughs> That's interesting, because that one's going a little bit afield, but not too far afield. You can understand how it also has a direction, it has a purpose, a goal, right? So the synagogue also is just an assembly. In fact, synagogue and ecclesia are, um, uh, what's the word we use? Uh, synonyms. They're synonyms. It's just, they're interchangeable in a lot of ways. Ecclesia means you've been called out of your home to a public place, summoned. Synagogue means you've been brought together or summoned. All right, these are basically the same thing. And while we're at it, we'll ask, what is another word for synonym? That's what you do with those to try to remember. All right, so the synagogue, you understand, is also the assembly. I remember one of my best friends, actually, in fact, my, uh, my best man, his, they were Jewish. His father was from Poland and um, Whenever I would be leaving their home to go to church, he would correct me and say, you're going to synagogue. 
<laughs> and I had to admit that he was right. Because in the New Testament, the synagogue is the gathering of persons. Now, it's interesting. I picked out these verses here on the screen in uh, Acts 6, 9, etc. To demonstrate to you that the word synagogue is not a technical term. In English it is, because that's obviously not an English word. I don't even know what that is, frankly. Because there's no U-E in the Greek. <laughs> That looks like it's maybe a Greek transliteration that came into English by way of French. But whatever. It's just a word that means the gathering, the assembly. And you can see this in Acts 6, 9, where the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called. So that's just the meeting or the gathering of the freedmen. 13, 5 of Acts, the synagogues of the Jews. Right. 17, 1 of the Jews. Well, you would think, in America, you say the word synagogue, you mean specifically a Jewish thing. Right. And if you say church, you mean a Christian thing. I'll put that in quotes, Christian. And uh, you say mosque, you mean a Muslim thing. Right? But actually, mosque, synagogue, church, they they're all the same thing, which is supposed to be an assembly of persons for a purpose, not the building in which they assemble. The, the point of these verses is to demonstrate that it's a generic word. If it meant specifically a Jewish place of worship, he wouldn't say the Jewish place, places of worship of the Jews. He would just say the Jewish places of worship, the synagogues. But that's not the case. It is a generic term for the assembling of persons. All right, so those are definitions, and I put them before you just so you can kind of start thinking about, well, what does it mean? That, what is it that we're doing? Well, what we're doing is we're being called out of our respective places of home and privacy, whatever, into a public forum or a public place, rather, for the purpose of of serving God, of worshiping God, of teaching God's word. Right? This is our purpose. That's what defines a church. But here I want to talk about the church because the New Testament talks about the church. So let's make some distinctions. Matthew 16, 18 is where Jesus says, I will build my church. The gates of Hades or the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That is his ecclesia, his assembly. He will build an assembly. This is clearly not a specific gathering, a specific congregation, but the concept of the people like the, the congregation in the wilderness. In Ephesians chapter 1, in verses 22 and 23, it's clear to see. God has put all things under Christ's feet. And God gave Christ as head over all things to the ecclesia, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So it is his body, that is his group of people meeting. They're all things to the church. That's the called out, the assembly this also is not a specific assembly like South Austin Church of Christ. It is the big picture that he talked about in Matthew 18. Or I'm sorry, Matthew 16, excuse me, verse 18. The congregation, the people of God, wherever they may be found. And in Colossians 1, there's a lengthy passage, but we're not reading all of it. I'm just grabbing the things necessary for this particular demonstration. And you see in Colossians 1 at verse 13, he's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, forgiveness of sins. So we have been delivered from the domain or the power of darkness into a, a transfer, meaning our citizenship has been moved into the kingdom of his beloved son. And that is 
just like we read in Ephesians. His body, over which he is the head, it is the church. The kingdom, the body, the church, these are the same thing. They're different ways of describing the group of people that belong to God. Now, that's the big picture church. Now, there's another thing happening in the New Testament, the synagogue. And I said before that it's a generic word for assembly, and that's true. We should look at this. <clears throat> in Acts 7, at verse 38, when... Uh, Uh, Stephen is speaking about the Old Testament, but really talking about the new one in veiled terms and in symbolism. He says, this Moses is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. Meaning when Moses was in uh, the wilderness with the people, the people were called the congregation. This is the synagogue, literally in Greek. The synagogue in the wilderness. Well, this does not mean that they erected four walls and met in some building that had a title synagogue. And, uh, you know, things that, no, it doesn't. It's the gathering of the people for the service of God. And in James chapter 2, um, a passage with which you may well be familiar, he says, if, uh, well, he warns us about showing partiality, and he sets up this uh, illustration with, if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and it goes on from there. But this word assembly in James 2.2 2 is actually synagogue. That's synagogue, James 2.2. 2. So, the first letter to the churches from Jerusalem after they had been scattered. If you look at James 1.1, 1, 1, that's who it's written to. Uh, calls them their various churches synagogues. If somebody comes into your synagogue dressed this way or that way, this does not mean that they erected four walls and set up a synagogue and hung their shingle out there and said, we're competing with the Jews, we're making a new religion out here. No, it's just the assembly. The people were gathered in public. That's all that it means. Later in James 5, 14, he speaks of the need for calling for the elders of the church, and that is ecclesia, not synagogue. But it's showing us that in James, synagogue and ecclesia are synonyms. They're interchangeable. He uses them that way. And we could use them that way too. In fact, if you start looking at it, you realize they are used that way very often in the book of the Acts just to avoid um, the awkward wording. Uh, what I mean by that is, uh, we have th uh, our famous example is sing a song. Um, do you need to, I mean, what else will you sing besides a song, right? And what else do you do with a song besides sing? But you have to say sing a song, and it's kind of silly. So they don't want to say, you know, whatever, ecclesiate and ecclesia. So they use two different words. And that's what's happening in Acts 11.26. For a whole year they met with the church. That is to say, for a whole year they synagogued with the ecclesia. <laughs> that's what it actually says. And in Acts 14.27, when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them, which is to say, when they synagogued the ecclesia together. <laughs> or when they synagogued the ecclesia because together is part of synagogue. That's the S-Y-N, the soon, or with. Uh, which, by the way, is your Latin, congregare. Synagoge is congregare. So the congregate or congregation is also the synagogue or the assembly. It's just Latin. Um, but yeah, they synagogued the ecclesia. And in Acts 20... Verses 7 through 8, 
you find on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread. Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. Clearly, when they are gathered to take to break bread, we are talking about the Lord's Supper. This is obviously what you and I would call a church in English, but the word that he uses is synagogue. First day of the week when we synagogued to break bread. Right? There were many lamps in the upper room where we synagogued. Now that's interesting too. There's a room in which you do this thing that is called synagogue, which is assembly. So very clearly, the reason why the lexicon included a reference to its use as a building much later is because in the text, it clearly is not the building. It's a thing that's done inside of a building sometimes, as this one was. There was a room where they were assembled, but the assembly is the gathering of the saints, whether there are walls or not. Uh, you can read in the Acts how that they met in Solomon's portico. Well, Solomon's portico is not the name of a very large conference room at a posh hotel. It is a public square. It's open air. So when the people met there, there weren't walls. They were out in public, exposed to the elements, frankly. But this is telling us that the synagogue is the gathering, the assembling of the saints. When we come together, that is the people, whether there are walls or not. So we talked about the church, which is the big picture of, of what God has done. The people, the congregation of those who fear uh, him and who love him, wherever they may be found all over the planet. But now we talk about a church, a specific congregation. And the scriptures talk about them in these ways. I've culled some verses that I think are the most important ones. Acts 14.23 says they appointed elders for them in every church. And having done this, with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. A very important verse for defining a church, a specific assembly in a specific locale, has elders over it, and they're committed to the Lord. So they're not organized, if you will, in any larger hierarchy than their individual gatherings and individual locations. There is the church that Jesus built in Matthew 16, 18, but this is a, a concept of something worldwide. The boots on the ground church is the assembling of the saints in a locality, a specific place. That locality has elders. And those elders are committed to the Lord. So they're not answerable to other elders or to uh, an overseeing board or any other hierarchy. Every individual congregation of God's people is answerable to God directly. And also in the 20th chapter of the Acts, you see Paul making a pit stop in Miletus and calling for himself the elders of the church at Ephesus, who were appointed, by the way, according to the directions given in 1 Timothy chapter 3. He left Timothy there, you may recall, to depart and continue on his journey, and he gave Timothy a letter with many instructions in it, but among those is 1 Timothy 3, the instructions for how to appoint elders just like they had done in Acts 14, 23, appointing elders in every place. He gave Timothy the instructions for how to appoint elders, which Timothy clearly did, because now, not three years later, if that, Paul, passing by there, can summon the elders to come to him. And they did, and he said to them many things, but among those things, in the 28th verse, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. But this is very consistent with what we read in Acts 14.23, that the elders have oversight in the church where they are appointed. 
they were appointed, you notice, or made into overseers, or be, they became elders by means of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit inspired the words that Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 3 that Timothy enjoined upon the church, which was the reason why those elders were appointed. That means those elders were appointed by the Holy Spirit. And their charge is to care for the church, as he says, pay attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Spirit has made you overseers. So they have a section, a subsection of the flock, some of the people, the congregation that meets with them. And the 32nd verse, I now commend you, elders, to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. All those who are sanctified is the church, the big thing, but they are the elders of a church, and they are commended directly to God and the word of his grace. And the, God, the word of his grace has the ability, he says, to build them all the way up and to give them the inheritance that is uh, the promised inheritance for all those who are sanctified. The entire church is pressing toward the same hope. All right, but this is telling us those elders were given the oversight of that local congregation. Those elders were commended directly to God. Every individual congregation answers directly to God. They're defined as the people who have come together, duly summoned by God's word to worship acceptably, And duly, uh, you know, commissioned by the word of God to accomplish the purposes of God. That's what defines an assembly, whether it has walls or not, whether it has a building, a meeting place, uh, or rents a place or whatever is immaterial. The assembly, the church of Christ is the assembly that belongs to the king that God has installed, that's Jesus. And it is our duty to accomplish the will of our king. This is a monarchy. Even though it's an assembly, it's not a legislature. It's not a congress. It's not a place for opinions and thinks so and back and forth. This is a monarchy. Jesus is the king. You and I are all of us, uh, if you will, performing. Sometimes people think, well, the preacher is the performer and the, the, the pew are the audience. You know, no, that's not true. We are all performing because we're all worshiping God. God is the audience. I'm performing a role within the body of teaching, and you are performing a role within the body, too, of taking this teaching to heart so that you might be able to teach others. And we worship together according to the scriptures and we do all the other things that are outlined in the scriptures that the saints do the people of god but we are the assembly we have come out of our homes to this public place for the purpose of serving god in various things that are um, enjoined upon us by the new testament yes but the big picture is for the purpose of serving God. We're doing the things that God wants his people to be doing when they come together. That's what defines the assembly. It And we are assembled, and we're assembled, you know, when we meet this morning, we're assembled when we meet this evening. It's the assembly of God's people. Whenever it happens, that's what it is. So you can understand what it is and what it isn't. I think those things are important. Um, you know, it's not good to be uh, caught up in a lot of questions about whether or not uh, this is an assembly. Um, you should understand that when you come out of your home uh, to a public place gathered together for the purposes of God, that's an assembly. That's the definition. Now, is it the assembly God wants? Well, that's a different question. Why did you come together? What are you doing? Why are you doing that? Right? Those are different. But the big picture is, you've come out of your homes together in a public place for the purpose of serving God. That's the church. That's the assembly. 
Every time you, that that happens, it's the assembly. Every time we are together like that, that's the assembly. So yeah, we assembled, you know, this morning, we're assembled this evening too. And this doesn't cease to exist tomorrow just because we didn't come out of our homes. We're still part of the church that Jesus talked about in Matthew 16, 18. Even if we're not actually assembled on Monday, for example. <laughs> so there are things there to think about. I hope that that is a useful definition to begin with. And then we can talk about the worship at another time, the Lord willing. Today, are you a Christian who has not lived right? Repent, make things right with God. If we can help you, we will do so with our prayers, with our encouragement, with Bible study, whatever we can do to be of service. That's what we want to do because we are, in fact, brought together here for God's purposes, not for selfish purposes. Let us help. If today you are not a Christian, become a Christian, repent of your sins, prepare yourself for the judgment day, be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins. God has given us this great blessing. Won't you take advantage of it? Won't you think about your own soul, your own salvation? If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to be baptized, please let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.